Hi guys, welcome to the weekly Fife Property Show. <laughs> we were due to do one at the weekend there the now, um, and we still are. It's going to be how to build the best portfolio and the biggest portfolio in Fife and, and create real wealth for yourself. Um, so today, we've decided just to do a midweek one and to see how it goes. Um, we've got some novices here for the first time on our Facebook Live and on our social media channels, LinkedIn and YouTube um, and Instagram as well. So I'm going to introduce you to the team. Um, we'll just come in. Hi guys, how is everybody doing? Hi, Hi everybody. We're in fine. Right guys, let's kick off and let's talk about each area. Um, I'm going to go first, um, just as a wee impromptu to the to the show. Um, what do you like most? Which area do you like the most and why? Mine's the St Monans, and, and I'll rattle through some of the things. Willie Boot Garden, um, the Diving Garnet, the Craig Miller Restaurant, New York Castle, the Old Kirk, the harbour, the Fife Coastal Path, the windmill, the salt pans, the East Nook Salt Company. What about yourself, Richard? Um, I think obviously being a leaving guy, I'm going to be biased and stay leaving, but I think the, the Blue Flag Beach, which sits on the Fife Coastal route, we've got the Glen, we've got Silverburn, we've got a lot of good parks, like maybe St. Uh, St. Uh, you know, King George, the fifth park, which did the amateur football as well. Um, and a lot of good schools and things as well, obviously, going to school and leaving and uh, the area myself. So, yeah, Brilliant. Yeah. Brilliant. Me, what about yourself? Hi, everybody. <clears throat> I like St Andrews. There's nothing better on a, a lovely sunny day in the summertime going along to St Andrews. You've got the beach, you've got the castles, you've got um, the, the buildings, the architecture, plus all the shops, and there's a lovely wee ice cream shop, and then your famous fish and chip shop. So just everything like that. It's just lovely. St Andrews is beautiful, isn't it? Uh, mm -hmm. What about yourself, Ruthie? Do you know, actually, I second me. I've been here for 20 years in Fife, and I'm still discovering everything. Um, the first time at Eden Beach, just a couple of weeks ago, it's fantastic. But my favourite, Castle Sands Beach in St Andrews. It's got the most beautiful, tiny little pieces of sea glass and pottery. Love it. Superb. Anne-Marie, what about yourself? Hi. So my my favourite place, I think, is Anstruther. I have to say Anstruther. Uh, moving up from England, um, I actually live in Dundee, but I spend most of my time in Fife. And I'd say Anstruther, and that's because, you know, you've got the you've got all the shops there, the, the beach is lovely, um, especially in the summertime. I just love walking through there. Everyone's friendly. To me, Anstruther stands out for me from someone from London. Fish and chip shops more than anything for Anstruther, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there's about four or five of them. There's loads of restaurants. There's, yeah. you know, there's boutiques. There's all brasses. The there's everything, you, everything you've got. It. I mean, it is really the main area for the East Nook, isn't it? Isn't yeah, it? absolutely. That's my favourite. <laughs> yeah. and, and, Andrea, what about yourself? Hi there. Um, well, I've lived in, in Newborough for 11 and a half years, so it's still one of my favourite places. Um, it's the start of the Fife Coastal Path. Uh, it's, the local community there is something absolutely amazing. I mean, at the moment, they've been out clearing roads just so that people, everybody can get to work through there. Uh, there's a great tradition in Newborough, the Cobble Boat Race, the Highland Games. They've got a distillery up and running as well, which, um, although they, they stopped distilling gin for a while, uh, along with the whiskey, and started distilling hand gel. Um, there's a bear hill, which is fantastic. Um, it's named, it's got a big cutout bear on it. There's also the bear pub. Uh, it goes back to Norman times uh, and Norman invasion. Uh, on the banks of the River Tay, you, you just, it's just so much to say about Newburgh is a fantastic place and you wish I was, you did I was about to, I was about to say the beer bum. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's been a few of those as well after a Saturday night out. My head. <laughs> it's, got, it's one of the very few places that's still got a post office, it's got a chemist, it's got a doctor's, it's got a dentist. It's got everything there that you need, primary school and then the local yeah. school in Cooper for secondary education. Fantastic. What about yourself, Jimmy? I'd probably say, um, being a golfer, St Andrews is my favourite, but living in Cooper, um, Super Cooper has got to be the, the best place for me. Um, the schools are great. Um, the train station as well, it's just so com easy to commute everywhere. So like Edinburgh in an hour, Dundee in half an hour. Um, and it's great for families as well. So you have like Muddy Boots, Kearney Farm. It's just, it has it all basically. Yeah, fantastic. It is a really nice area. I, I love Cooper as well. Eh? Um, it is really central, and it's like what you say, it's quite good for commuting. I mean, you just get straight out the road, and you're on to the A92, and you can either go to Dundee, or you can go right down into Glenrothes and Kirkcaldy and Edinburgh, 
Um, it's it's a, it's a real good central area. I, I mean, Cooper originally a market town. It was the place, and then the Bonny Gate was the Bonny Gate used to have a big arch over it way back in the 1600s or thereabouts. Somebody might correct me, and they used to have to pay a toll to actually get through there with your horse and oh. cart. Wow. So you know, I, they took away they took away the arch um, years and years ago, um, but they actually had an arch and. It was all the. I wasn't there. I wasn't there. Uh, <laughs> Anne Marie was. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't there that old at the time. Um, so they took away the arch actually years ago, but but they did actually have a proper a, a proper uh, toll system where you actually paid to use the road on your horse and cart and get through. Um, oh. Remarkable place. Um, huge amount of history. And at one point, I'm not really sure if I'm right about this. I'm sure it was the capital of Scotland at one point. I mean, I'm talking about in the 1300s or something uh, crazy like that. Yeah, I just about it. Series is just around the corner. Now, Series has got the oldest Highland Games in the world, over 700 yeah. years old, decreed by Robert the Bruce in the, in the celebration for the men coming back from the Battle of Bannockburn in 1314. That's amazing, eh? Yeah. yeah. And oh. when you think about it, I mean, Gino... Uh, Fred and uh, Gordon Ramsay Gordon, were at yeah. Highland Games a couple of years back there. Watched that on TV, actually. Yeah. 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 Was good. What about yourself, Shaida? Favourite town? Um, there's a couple of them, but um, <laughs> you really took St. Mullen, so that's that's one. Um, <laughs> but I, I think the second one would have to be Dysart. I do like St. Andrews as well, and they yep. have beautiful beaches. Um, but Dysart is particularly good because you are right close by the Ravenscraig Gardens, and then you can also go to the Ravenscraig Castle, um, which is also a really nice view from there. Um, you can go down to the beach, take a walk, pick up some. If you're into picking up glass, then you can pick up loads of glass, sea glass, um, and then to the off to the other side, you have a coastal path, um, which will take you into West Wings. And um, the castle is there as well, mm -hmm. so it offers a lot yeah. to the public. Um, and then and it was the one of the locations for Outlander. Harbor. It was one of the locations for filming Outlander as well, the Dysart Harbour. Yes, I was I there at the time. I was there at the time. Yep, yep, yep. yep. picture. She yep. was one of the walk, walk oh, by beautiful man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was really something, seeing those old ships come in and watching the set being put together. It was, it was something. It was a nice experience. So, yeah, I was glad I was there for that. It's a bit different when you go down there and look at it now and then you kind of look mm. back at the Outlander and you think, wait a minute, is this the same place? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I was following the show at the time as well, so having seen all the CG put in afterwards, I thought, well, yeah. it doesn't look too much different. But, yeah, the crew were really great. They weren't disruptive, and it was something nice for the village to see. So. And it's on the Faith Coastal Path as well, which is absolutely mm -hmm. fantastic. You know, I'm very, very exciting. Uh, Charlotte, what about yourself? Uh, probably Lucas because of Tensmere Beach and Kinshoddy. Um, absolutely love it. It's got the crepe shack, um, the play park hey. here, they in the play park. So it's absolutely beautiful. Great walks. Let the kids off the leash and let them run. And it's blessed. <laughs> let, <laughs> let them go, run. <laughs> Brilliant. Excellent. Okay, guys, thanks very much uh, for coming on the show. Um, so we're going to talk about today the busiest uh, uh, December for the Fife housing market. So I'm just going to run the introduction to the show. And uh, guys, QT QVT. So guys, the, 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 the December of the Fife housing market since 2006. Over the last six months, the Fife property market has been flourishing. As soon as the estate agents for sale flag went up, neighbours would be checking on right move to see the internal pictures and compare the asking price to their own home. Go on. I mean, admit it. Everybody does that, doesn't it? Don't they? <laughs> I do. Absolutely. 
<laughs> so flabbergasted by optimistic asking price tags, those same five homeowners stood open mouthed to see sold slips added on the boards a few weeks later. Now I had that personal experience in Crail, where I put one of the properties on it. Um, oh, was it Balcormy Avenue or Balcormy's place? Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. Uh, and and the people actually contacted me three doors down when we put the sold slip on ten days later, and they couldn't believe it. They're, they said, "Well, we laughed when you put it on." And then subsequently, a sold went on it, and our jaw dropped to the ground. Literally, um, that's how that's how big it was. So, five property values have actually gone up five point three percent compared to a year ago. Um, and the newspaper are full of stories of this mini property market boom, which has been fueled by the land and buildings transaction uh, tax cut, which is basically stamp duty to you and I. Uh, which ends on the 31st of March. Not only Not has it put up the values in Fife, but it has also theoretically brought forward the moves from 2021 to 2020. Most of the up-to-date transaction figures, well, the number of people moving home, endorse it too. In the UK, 137,000 uh, properties were actually sold. Uh, you can see it on the chart here. 137,200 property sales transactions took place in December. That's the highest number of sales transactions in December since 2006, when it topped at 149,200 transactions, only to fall to 32,700 transactions in December 2008 at the height of the credit crunch. That's unbelievable. So, you know, what's your, I mean, Richard, what's your thoughts on this? Yeah, I mean, obviously, those kind of stats, and, and we're not surprised with those figures. Uh, obviously, we're on we're on the ground, and we could see the demand that's here and has been here since the tail end of the end of lockdown. Um, and this is what's driving this this forward. The the increase in demand and the reduced supply of properties is just pushing properties up and pushing properties up, and and the turnaround is just uh, phenomenal uh, with the sales market and and the rental market as well. I mean, we spoke about these on the weekend show. Uh, these kind of stats and um, they uh, clearly ex uh, explain obviously to people that are maybe in doubt of how uh, buoyant things are at the moment uh, actually what's going on yeah absolutely jimmy what's your thoughts on this yeah i would um agree with richard and say that the numbers, the numbers are not surprising um looking at the numbers from the last week as well it's only going to it's not stopping anytime soon as well, is what I'm trying to say. Um, and I was the same as you, Jim. I've had people that are now bought recently and they're seeing sold signs going up or they're seeing properties listed in and around their area, in and around their area at a certain price. And they're thinking, if theirs is worth that, what's mine got to be worth now? And then yeah. they're calling us out and also making a move because they're making, making profits on something that they didn't think or didn't plan on doing, but thinking I've got to capitalize on it basically. Yeah, Anne Maria, have you seen this in the East Nuke? Um, yes, I have. Um, absolutely. Um, they've. I mean, I spoke to someone even just today. Um, you know, they they were saying they um, they've seen properties just flying out the door, so they know that the um, demand out there, you know, is is um, outweighing supply. Um, yeah. A lot of people are actually aware of this. Um, people that I speak to that are looking to sell their property. There's someone I spoke to today. You know, he's eager to get his on for the same reason he knows mm -hmm. that now it's time to sell if he's going to sell so um yeah and that was just today <laughs> what yeah. about the rental market me is that the same sort of thing i mean is demand outstripping supply in the rental market as well oh yeah i mean we have loads of inquiries coming in each day and we just didn't have the properties to to fill that um i mean there's vendors out there's say uh, landlords out there looking for properties to buy so that they can um put these into the rental market and hopefully the, it'll, it'll suit everybody it'll, it'll um, improve everybody's lifestyle begin them properties to live in and then gain them income for to to um to go on with yeah, I mean, uh, Andrea, do you think do you think the rental market, the fact that people are buying in the rental market, are actually are actually um, fueling the sales market? I think there's a lot of people that are selling their houses now are deciding to go into rental properties. Yeah. Um, so I think it's swinging both ways. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just that that's maybe why there's more of a demand because people. Are not sure exactly what property they want to go into to buy and make that yeah. commitment to so they're going to rent check out the place and and see what they like at that point and what's available yeah and, and ultimately that will have a knock-on effect then to property management are you, are you seeing that as well charlotte where, where property management's a bit um 
a bit more there's a bit more activity there's a lot more people yeah definitely i think as well we've got so many more land, new landlords coming on with an abundance of properties um that we can help them manage and get them through everything that they need to to get them rent and quick yeah. um, do you see that as well yes yes of course yeah i mean um in the last couple of months there have been more phone calls coming through even just organically from what people have seen online and um, whether or not they're buying a property through five properties like i just said, was on the phone today again with another guy who is looking to put an offer in on a house on monday but he's keen to move forward on the letting side and um well it's, it's, it's positive overall so there is some growth there and i've seen a change um mm -hmm. in in the in the in the way people are behaving and how they, how eager they are to move on um yeah. the letting side so that's good. That's positive for the market. Yeah, I mean, the exact figures from the land registry for Fife won't be available for another six months or um, uh, another six weeks or so. Yeah, in December 2019, 515 properties changed hands in Fife. Looking at anecdotal, ev anecdotal evidence for the, the sale board changes, uh, my database and portals, I believe, will probably end up in this December past by round about 669 to 699 five property sales transactions for December um, 2020. So it's a huge difference in terms of the market. I mean, the number of UK property transactions continue to be relatively stable between November 2019 and March 2020. And that decreased uh, by around half um, in midway in April, uh, April, May 2020 compared to April, May 2020. Uh, 19. Triggered by the economic impacts relating to the public health restrictions introduced. But since the first lockdown, it's lifted to late spring. Sale transactions have increased steadily upwards for each month, uh, mirroring the relaxing public health restrictions for the property market during the summer and the autumn of 2020 and introducing the land and buildings transaction tax holidays. Aye. Now, but before we get the champagne out and the court flowing here... <laughs> What the December national figures um, and corresponding provisional five stars uh, don't tell us is that April to December 2020, so this is April to December 2020, um, compared to um, April to December 2019, shows uh, a 13.7% down compared to these, these numbers. So the market has actually, um, in the terms of the property sales from 2019 to 2020, from April to December, has actually has actually gone less. Um, and that's quite surprising to me, because um, I would have thought it would have been more with everybody coming out of lockdown. But, I mean, it's impressive given that in the middle of the session, we're in the middle of the session, and even more remarkable considering it was, now remember this, this was an eye-watering when you think about it and you look at this statistic. Um, a 48.7% fall in transactions from 2008 to 2007. Mm. So in other words, when the credit crunch kicked in, right, in 2007, basically the bottom fell out of the whole market and the number of transactions dropped like a stone. You know, that's ultimately what happened there. Um, so um, a lot of people ended up coming to market later on in 2009 when all the when they went into the when they went into the market because they had to be sold um, because of repossessions and asset management and that. So the biggest question now though, now, though is, is how much of the urgency uh, since the summer um, uh, uh, to buy property can be credited to the following. Now this is what we're going to talk about just now. Um, credit to the following: the existing pent up demand that built up in 2018-19 and was starting to be released in the Boris bounce in January and February 2020. The new demand for home workers working from bigger properties, uh, people moving out of the big city centres, and land and buildings transaction tax cut, or a mixture of four. You know, anybody got any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think I think it is a mixture. Um, there are certain factors I think that influence things more, but. Yeah, like you say, that the mixture of all, all these these factors do influence obviously the, the market at the moment. I think as we like we talk about um, there being a, a fall in transactions and things, and like things being busier. But we did spend a big portion of the year in lockdown, and where we were kind of restricted with transactions, and then we spent a small portion of the year being really busy and doing quite a lot, um, which obviously you can see in, in the figures that uh, you've shown there. So, yeah. I mean, Jimmy, what's, what's your thoughts on this? Is this a combination of all four or? I would say 
Those numbers that you put up there in terms of transactions being down, I don't believe them. Because <laughs> um, <laughs> the, I, I'm thinking if that well, you're, well, you're on the front line ultimately. When you think about yeah. it, you're on the front line. You see the amount of inquiries coming through. But and then when the numbers are actually realised, it's like, well, how could be how could transactions actually yeah. be down when that's the case? Because I can see a whole load of transactions in the pipeline. So are we are we are we are you predicting another boom? Yeah, well, I would say if the transaction is done with that time frame, the transactions for the next, say the next six months or the next window that you're gonna that you're gonna put together yeah. is gonna be frightening because that's yeah. when yeah. um the delay of working from home solicitors is just taking a longer process. So the next months that you see I can only see it being a frightening number that people people won't believe um, because we've had people accepting offers in when we first went into lockdown early April um, and then he just went through sort of November time so you're yeah. not still seeing the benefits for those that we were but that was a long process where we're on the phone pushing them through and and trying to get everything in place for them to go through so I think the boom is still there and it's going to continue to go on. And I think the numbers, I think people will be surprised about the numbers in the future that they see in the future. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But you've seen that as well, Anne Marie. Well. Yeah, definitely. Those numbers don't reflect of what we see on the ground every day. That's why I've, you probably saw my face shock horror. What, what you know? Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, especially people now that, you know, they, they can work from home, they can, you can live anywhere now. As you said, you don't have to be in the big cities anymore, you know? Um, so it's a combination of all four. You know what you what you mentioned earlier. Okay, so. Richard, what's your thoughts on this? Yeah, I was just thinking, obviously, uh, looking ahead for the, the the next six months or so. And Jim, you were saying earlier about the impact that the demand in the rental market is going to have on the sales market. Uh, and I think as uh, we're seeing it already, and we're going to see more of it. I mean, I'm I work with a lot of investors and landlords and things, and they they're wise to the fact that they they there is a great demand for rental property, and we're, we're we're running out obviously stock and um, we're quite low in stock and um, so that's yeah. influencing them to pick up new buy to let investments and jimmy you've seen it we've all seen it coming through the offices um, and we've got a lot coming on that's been picked up recently not just for ourselves but through other agents and coming to the market for rent so i think that'll be a big part of uh, pushing sales forward as well for the next uh, six months to a year oh, okay. um, with investors and landlords putting investment buy to let yeah, well, yeah i don't see today, jimmy? Oh. Sorry, carry on, Andrea. Sorry, I was. I don't see where some people get their official figures from because I heard on Radio Scotland this morning that the official uh, release from the RICS, you know, the Royal Institute of Chartered Surveyors, was mm -hmm. that uh, the property market is flattening, which I don't see, and also that the valuations are not coming up as much as mm -hmm. they had been previously, which also we are not seeing as well. So I don't know. Where to get them yeah, from? I think a, a lot of national statistics. Maybe they've learned Maybe they've learned it. 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 Maybe Things that they must have missed along that, the that way. That is an important point because when you think about the logic of that, um, you do have the Halifax, the Nationwide, all these different companies um, uh, with their mortgage, and and, and then they, they come out with these statistics, and it's like, wait a minute, who am I supposed to believe? Because mm -hmm. one says the property market's going up four percent, another one says six percent, another one says eight percent, another one says we're due for a, a, a recession, and it's like, who, who's who's telling the truth here? And it's and, and it's it's yeah. old saying it is lies it was it lies damn lies and statistics <laughs> <laughs> i think it's good to look at five as a, as a market on its own as well individually because in comparison to even other areas of scotland and obviously the rest of the country um our, our figures and what we see coming through differs for some of the contradictory st stats that you get from like national um like what we were talking about the weekend jim was the negotiator that had some stats out and we were just like those didn't ring true yeah, um, it, it doesn't make any sense at all. You know, they were coming out. The Halifax is predicting a, 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 a they had a price rise of four point six percent, but they're, they're pre predicting a recession. And I'm like, I can't see anything like that at all. Mm -hmm. And then the the uh, this negotiator says, "Is it time to leave the buy to let market?" And I'm thinking, "This yeah, is time to get into the market. I've just bought another thing." Yeah, <laughs> yeah I know. I'm saying, 
Yeah, saying about that, and I've I've been speaking to well, I've got I've got three three landlords and investors right now who are calling me up, um, looking to pick stuff up. But the market is so strong right now, the stuff on the market, they just can't buy because they're all trying to just start their journey and doing a buy, refurbish, refinance sort of is their strategy. But there's just nothing for them to pick up, so they're coming to me trying to get stuff off market or, or wanting me to run the numbers by them on on the refurb or what it could be top dollar so um they can try and get it going but there's just nothing out there because property prices or properties are just going that quickly and and for good value right now that's when as an investor you've got to be prepared to pay the home report or above really at this yeah. point in time and it is about it is about making sure your numbers are right before you do that um yeah. i think the days just now of the lowballing um uh, uh sellers and um, with cheeky offers is over it's not going to yeah. happen just now you have to pay home reporter above to get it and, and if you want it before it goes to market you'll have to pay above that's i think yeah. that's the key mm-hmm. yeah i would yeah. say agree i'd say the the low ball offer is is no is no longer in this current market or non-existent mm-hmm. okay so talking to many buyers and sellers and agents and solicitors in the five property market over the last three or four months um, the anecdotal evidence is I've cl- are collated from people seems that the implied the outbreak of activity in the five property market has mainly led uh, and it's put down to lifestyle factors. I mean, you know, people have wanted a bigger house with the office space, uh, the pent up demand, meaning that land and buildings tax, um, in other words, the stamp duty holiday, is seen as the icing on the cake for most people. I mean, it is a, it is a, it is a, it is a factor here in Scotland, but it's only up to £2,100 you're gaining. Um, in England, it's a huge difference because it's up to half a million in terms of the, the the threshold. So if you buy a property at half a million, you're probably saving yourself about twenty thousand pound in it. You know, and and that's where they're up in arms about saying if this is getting taken away, we're probably going to miss that deadline. Um, exactly what you said, Jimmy, about you know if it's taken since last last April to get over the line in November, how long is it going to take somebody from November to get over the line? Are they going to get over the line by March? Yeah, and then. I'd, uh... When you think about the logic, what about the people that are buying now? Are they going to be thrown to the side and they'll have to get in line and wait because the other people want to actually get in before them? I had an offer yesterday. Do you think we'll get it completed before the 31st of March? <laughs> Did you laugh? <laughs> <laughs> no chance. <laughs> uh, that was from the solicitor. So I just, uh, okay, you're the conveyor. I said, I, I don't think I've seen a mortgage get through that quickly. Yeah. And I don't know how long, but if you, I'll take it to my client. If you feel like you can get the work done, but ultimately you can get all the conveyance and done. The mortgages yeah. are taking so long right now. It's I think I it's tell, a non-starter. I tell you my, my personal experience. My personal experience is obviously I wanted to do buy clip mortgages, um, but immediately I went to the mortgage works, and the mortgage works turned around straight away and said, "You've got no chance of making it before the end of the tax year." Um, and I thought, well, that's no good to me. So I, I end up buying cash then now, um, and and because I've had to buy cash, um, it's, it makes it quicker for me. So I could actually get because I'm buying cash, I can get it in six weeks. Mm-hmm. So I, I, if you're prepared to do that, or if you're in a position to do cash, then you could do it in six weeks. And then what you do in a buy to let is clearly you wait six months and then you remortgage it and take it all back out. You do it again, you know, it's rinse and repeat. Yeah. Uh, and it's attracting. And we're going to talk about that on our show on Saturday morning, aren't we, Richard? Anyway, we're going to yeah. talk about attracting. Yeah. The right investors to become your bank instead of actually using the bank that makes an absolute that makes absolute sense because people out there want a guaranteed return potentially of maybe three and four percent or five percent on on their investment um it can be secured against the property so why not become the uh, bank to a person wanting to do buy to let you know it makes everybody wins in that situation so there is ways to do that and, and reasons to do that but um we'll work that out anyway so, um, overall, the vast majority of house purchases, um, this allows a reasonable hopeful that it will, it will happen with the stamp duty uh, as before the stamp duty is withdrawn on the 31st of March. However, some newspapers are preaching the story that the property market will collapse without stamp duty extension. I can't kind of see that. If your market is restricted now by the number of transactions and the demand is still there, the prices will continue to go up. So if you put the stamp duty extension again, are you not fueling the market even more? Yeah, well, I think they've got to give some leeway of some sort. I kind of don't think they can just say it's this day or or tough luck, basically, because if you complete the day after, you're going to be absolutely... Gutted. 
I know. I wouldn't have wanted to use another one. <laughs> if that was me, I'd be, I'd be yeah. kicking up all sorts. Um, but because you you could you could do everything right, but someone else restricts you from completing on that day, and you miss out on thousands of pounds worth of benefits. That just it doesn't seem right. So it I think you're going to have to give a leave. It may actually be your buyer. It might be the seller. It could be the seller. Exactly. It could be the mortgage company as well. It could be anybody that delays that. I think I think reasonably they should be looking at the stamp duty threshold and possibly saying everybody that's in transactions now can can complete <laughs> and later in the year and everybody that does it after the 31st will then continue to have to pay it from then on. Yeah. I think that's the I think that's the rule of the, what they should be doing. Yeah. That would be the fairest yeah. thing to do. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I think when Obviously, you try to avoid as many chains as possible when you're in a transaction process. But if you're fourth, third or fourth person down the chain is maybe in England and they're relying on that saving that they're making on their stamp duty to be able to do their purchase. And then they find out they're not going to get it. They'll withdraw from their sale yeah. or their purchase. They just won't. You sound like you're in a big cave, Andrea. <laughs> yeah. I am. It's called 97 Bonnygate. <laughs> I'll get my head out of the bucket. <laughs> now, remember, nobody can argue that the face withdrawal of stamp duty holiday would be better than some home buyer sales falling through when the tax holiday finishes in March. Even if your motivation isn't to save money on the tax holiday, it could be the motivation of a buyer and your chain, meaning it will become an issue. If, if you're in a chain with somebody else and they can't complete in time in order to make that happen and you're the one that delays them, it could have a huge knock-on effect to everybody else and everybody else could end up having to pay their stamp duty. So that that could be an issue as well. I mean, nobody knew in July when the tax holiday was announced that they would, they would get into two national lockdowns with inevitable delays for remote working by solicitors, mortgage providers, local authority search departments, you name it, everybody was delayed, including ourselves. We were working from home. My advice to all people currently um, uh, subject to uh, contract and sold uh, is to ask the question. I mean, what if, uh, what if we don't complete the sale by the end of March? Um, better to sort it out now than to have a nasty surprise in the last week of March. So if you've got your solicitor out there, go to your solicitor and ask them that question. What if we don't complete the sale by the end of March? What's going to happen? It's at the end of the day, if all people then ask that question to their MPs, their MSPs, their you know their solicitors, their mortgage brokers, there's going to be a huge influx of people saying to the government, "There's got to be something done about this." You know, that's the reality. Yeah. Oh, well, I'm getting regular yeah, phone calls you. now from sellers saying, "Well, chasing, asking, asking for updates on their sale," and I'm having to. To call solicitors and find out updates and re relay that to them and try and put put a little bit of pressure on. So yeah, it's definitely you got to keep keep on top of your solicitors. I mean, I think it's probably clear that uh, property taxation is long overdue a reform. Um, I mean, stamp duty um, um, and council to council tax. When you think about it, I mean, when uh, I obviously in Scotland, we're in Scotland. <laughs> I apologise for saying this when Margaret Thatcher tried to change the rates to uh, to poll tax in the late 1980s. Those who are old enough to can remember the poll tax riots, uh, oh, I can remember them. Yeah. Hence the nervousness of any party since to make any changes. I mean, everybody's nervous to make changes to this. There's no way the government will abolish the stamp duty of the land and buildings tax because it raises between, listen, 11 billion and 13 billion a year. Yet with all the upheaval we've experienced in the last year, there could be an appetite to change the way property is taxed anyway. I mean, the government, if when you think about it, has already spent 271 billion, that's eye-watering, on interventions due to the pandemic and needs every penny so it can start to repay those debts over the coming decades. We, I mean, we talked about this already in another show about the Office of Tax Simplification is actually looking to change capital gains tax. You know, they're looking to change capital gains tax to actually take it away completely from second homeowners and re revise it. So second homeowners will no longer have that exemption of a capital gains tax, but they'll be based on, they could be based on indexation, but their allowance of 12,500 or what it is the now will actually be taken away or reduced to a few thousand. You know, that's, that's going to be a big hit. But the government believes when the Office of Tax um, and Simplification did this, that they could raise 19 billion in extra tax because of this, off of second homeowners. 
Yeah. How will that affect the market? Well, I think yeah, the, the main market it will affect the ability to buy the select market, but ultimately yeah, there's not enough housing. <laughs> yeah, we'll have a big effect on the market, I think, at some point. Um, but like you see, obviously, the government's pumped so much money in, they need to look at ways to obviously uh, obviously turn that around uh, in time and get money back, and that's where this, uh, this will come into play. But yeah, I think it will have an effect, but we'll just have to wait and see how that pans out. Well, when you think about it, though, um, if anybody's a second homeowner, the only thing you need to worry about is obviously when you're selling. It's completely irrelevant about taxation and capital gains tax on a property until you realise that asset and actually sell it. So, you know, if you're not yeah. selling in the near future, it makes no difference at all. If you are selling now, you'll maybe get it over the line if you've got somebody to sell it to quick and they're a cash buyer. But it's probably unfortunate that you're probably going to get caught in the Chancellor's review in March where he's going to change the capital gains rules for second homeowners. And whether that's going to be phased until next year, um, I, I don't know. I've got a funny feeling they're just going to hit us with it straight away. So it will have an implication for that. And it will, what it possibly might do as well is it, is it might put people off. It might actually put people off selling. Think about that, because if you think, uh, you know, why would I sell then? Because I'm just going to get taxed to the hill. I mean, we'll keep it and, and let it and continue to let it. So it might actually stop people actually selling, therefore alleviating the number of houses in the market. And therefore, the government's going to have to come up with a problem and solve it by building more houses. Yeah, I think um, it, could get, it could get stagnant, basically, because people won't want to sell them and people won't buy them. It's simple as that, because they're just going to get get a big hit yeah. so i think everybody will just come to a standstill a second home when you think about it is not based on a need it's based on an investment or or a lifestyle really yeah. that's it so if you are if you've not got a, a compelling reason to sell um what would drive you to do that then i mean if you're going to get taxed more by selling and a tax on selling then you're possibly not going to let go of the property i i, I mean I'm, i this is me coming back i mean we're, we're, this is chewing the fat here this is me coming back to saying the council need to build houses again they need to start building affordable houses they need to start building them in the areas where they're required and that's the council that need to do that backed up by government policy that's that has to happen not private house builders because that's a different regime they can there's a market for them but council housing and social housing there's definitely a need and a drive for that Twenty-five thousand houses a year are needed to keep up with the growth in our population. We are building less than 18,000 every single year, and, and 22,000 is probably the highest it's been in a long time. And that, so that kind of shows you where it is. I was well, going to ask, is there a differentiation between a second property owner and a second home owner? Because not everybody that has a second property lives in it or uses it for their own lifestyle. Um, there maybe have it as a business. They're probably like yeah. full-time landlords. Yeah, uh, you know there there is no di there is a differentiation if you're doing holiday lets because it's a different tax regime and it's mm -hmm. a holiday let and a what is serviced accommodation basically is classified as um, it's classified in a different schedule per tax. It's classified as a commercial property, therefore it's not chargeable to to, uh, to council tax, but it's chargeable to rateable value. Um, and and you know one of the things that you know is quite um, quite annoying is the fact that they get away with rates then because they're under the mm -hmm. threshold and they're a, they're a small business of classes so they don't pay rates so maybe that's maybe yeah. that's the new recourse is the fact to get uh, second homeowners which are actually service accommodation to pay rates you know that's probably the one of the strategies that they'll end up doing um, I always find it difficult because we've been a mainstream landlord I rent and house a lot of people hundreds of people over the years. And yet I'm penalised with people that will hold a second holiday home and maybe visit twice a year, you know, and they're not even making any use of it at all. But I'm providing a, a, a supply and a, and a, a, a service to the, the community because, you know, you guys, you know yourself that the people at our house are often not able to be housed anywhere else. But but that's one of my policies to help out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I agree, I agree. So, I mean, I have the feeling that most five property buyers and sellers will compromise on the price they pay for their next home to cover the cost of the stamp duty after the April. Rather than lose out the chance of owning the forever home they longed for during the first lockdown. 
Uh, therefore, uh, we really don't be alarmed when we, see, uh, but we see property price, uh, property values easing slightly in quarter three of 2021, when the price paid for property reflects the lower price to account for the, the stamp duty that will need to be paid um, from the first day of order. I mean, it's a couple of thousand pounds, but if, if you're talking about, if you're talking about um, some, for some people, a couple of thousand pounds is a significant difference, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. I think a lot of people will be the difference between moving and not moving a couple yeah. of thousand pounds sometimes, and it can be the difference between getting your dream home and not. Simple as that. Yeah. It can right. often pay your solicitor fees as well when you think about yeah. it that way. Yeah, you've got solicitor fees, and then you've got your, yeah. I suppose you'll be getting a bigger mortgage, so then you've got a mortgage broker fees as well, and mm -hmm. then, then you've got um, your searches. Uh, you know, you've got quite a lot of things involved in that. So the costs are all going to be a lot higher and you've accounted for that possibly, but you've got to then pay another couple of thousand on top of that. I mean, this is for people in the 250,000 bracket when you think about it or above because they're the ones who are getting that full exemption up to £2,100. Um, so it, it might make a difference. But for some people, they actually mortgage themselves to the hill and they don't have any extra money to put mm -hmm. towards that. So it possibly might be. You might have a, a, wee, a wee easing of the property prices as a result of that. Mm. Final thoughts, guys. What's your thoughts on this? Can I say something? Yeah, thank you. yeah absolutely. Yeah. I'm just listening to you speak about um, where things are going and how housing is needed and how the council needs to step in. And you're very passionate about this, and that comes forward. Have you ever considered joining for MP, maybe? <laughs> no, <laughs> never, never. You know what the hey, you know, problem with me being an MP is I, I, I tell the truth all the time. <laughs> <laughs> that is the problem, Tiger. Trust me, I've been caught no, in by the Labour Party, the Conservative Party, the yeah. SNP, and everybody's always said to me, how do you fancy becoming a, you know, and it's like, no chance. I am far too honest. I, I'd say everything. Well, that's what I get as well, and I have a tenant telling me they don't want to deal with me, but I'm sorry if I give it to you straight and you don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, and that's a oh, thing. That's the best thing. Like Final thoughts on this, Richard. What's your thoughts? Um, Overall. Yeah, I think obviously um, a lot of interesting statistics there and, and views um, on different areas of the market, whether it be buy to let, investors, the sales market and things. And things are changing and things are changing for the good. And we see it, um, like I say, on the ground every day. Um, it's anybody's guess how things are ultimately going to pan out come the end of the year. But I see good things and I think that the market's going to continue to prosper throughout this year. So I'm quite excited to see how things pan out. Yeah. yeah. Jimmy, Jimmy. Yeah, I'll just back Richard up, really. Um, the boom is still happening. There's still not enough properties to sell. Like you said, I think you said, maybe said there's earlier, Jim, there's like, let's just take the East Newt, for example. There's no properties for sale in St. Monans. Um, right now in Cooper, there's only a handful available. Um, so if you're looking to, to sell, now is the now is the time basically now is the time now is the time but what do you think what do you think is, is everybody sitting on their hands you know are they, what's what is stopping everyone what's stopping everyone because you know you know inquiries are actually we're not getting that many inquiries as we usually got before so my concern is actually what is actually stopping people if now is the time to sell i, I think, think well sorry, I, I, Jimmy. I was going to say, I think a lot of people are waiting to find their ideal property coming to the market first, and then they'll decide, right, we better get someone out to value ours and get that on the market. Now, we've seen it, but they're too slow. It's going to go. There's not enough stock mm -hmm. there. So it's to get around that mentality that basically if you're wanting to move, then you need your own house on the market, preferably with an offer on it before you can even think of looking at anything else. It's a classic example of what you said. It's chicken or egg, isn't it? I mean, yeah. we've been this before. It's like I'm not going to, I'm not going to put my house in the market, or I'm not going to do anything until I find my best, my best property. But the reality is, uh, guess what? Everybody else is thinking, uh, and it's a stalemate. You're, 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 you're both yeah. stuck. So unless you put it on, and what we call effectively is managing the sale, you know, which you can easily do, and we have done loads of times. And you can then find your dream home and be in the best position to do that. Unless you do that, you'll not get any further forward than actually buying a house. Because, you know, classic example, George Terrace came on and it was away before it even got to market. Yeah. It was away on a live launch on Facebook. Burnside came on. It was away on a live launch on, on Facebook. You know, that, you know, live launch on Facebook, way, it's away, done, dusted. You've missed it. You've missed the boat completely. 
I think some like vendors and that have to be flexible. I mean, I think it's fantastic if you can get an offer accepted on your property, but then you put it in jeopardy because you say, oh, I can't find a house. You know, go into rented. Just, you know, it might not be your ideal house, but go into rented. Your ideal house will come up. You have yeah. to make some compromises, but don't lose. The worst thing to do is to lose out on a sale. A lot of people, yeah. a lot of people, go through the pain of thinking about the process of moving to rented accommodation. I, I think that's a big driving factor. That they, they start to think about all the things that they'll have to do as a result of, and they take their eyes off the fact that they could find their dream home and get everything they ever wanted. You know, I think that's the biggest challenge in, in yeah. people's minds and their perception. It's like if I go into rented accommodation, I'm going to be there for ages. I'm maybe not going to find my best house, and then guess what? Everybody looks at rented accommodation as throwing money then in the fire. But that's not throwing money in the fire. You're actually putting yourself in a position and you're using somebody else's resources for a short term period in order to find the home of your dreams. Mm -hmm. My God, that is not yeah. throwing money in the fire. Because yeah. in 20 years time, when you're sitting in front of your toasty stove or your coal fire or your wood burner, you'll be sitting going, I'm glad I made that decision. I'm glad I invested that money in myself and in my future. I didn't throw it in the fire, so to speak. Excuse the pun, because yeah. we're talking about stoves and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but but you know what you know what the thing mean? It's the theory behind that. It's like you're not you're actually investing it to to move on from there. Yeah. Plus, well, it puts them in a better position because they're not in a chain when they do find right. their dream home. Nothing to sell. Yeah, that's and right. it's a classic example as well as you have enough money. Then you know your circumstances. Another benefit of that is you don't put yourself under pressure. You don't put yourself under pressure because there's a lot of people that then find a dream home. They then uh, get told by the person that they're buying it from, you've got two months to sell your house. And if you don't sell your house within two months, you've lost your dream home. We'll put it back on the market. And then therefore, if it doesn't happen for them in the two month period, they then get under pressure. They put everybody else under pressure, including us. We've heard it before. It's like, how's it no sold? How's it no sold? It's like, guess what? You're gonna have to reduce the price. You know why you're going to have to reduce the price? Because you've put yourself under pressure. You've put yourself in a corner because you've made it conditional upon you getting an offer by a certain period of time. And the buyer for that price is not in the market at this point in time. This is what I come back to as well about saying when you get a lot of people as well that turn around and say, you know, um, it's my first offer. I'm not going to accept. No, I'm not going to accept it because it's the first offer. But I tell you what, it's the best offer. And yeah. just with the first offer, I mean, the buyer might have been in the market for six months. That's the reality. But you've not been in the market for six months, but you've just gone on, and that's why you found them, and they found you. So yeah. that's what you have to consider when you do that. So also, final thoughts on this, really. I mean, was there any, anybody else got any final thoughts on this before we wrap up? Yeah, it's all about mindset, really, isn't it? You know, yeah. you have to let them to get them to think differently. And that's, I've had so many conversations like that where people just can't get their head around the fact that, well, you know, they, they need to find something before they sell theirs. They just can, can't possibly let go yet. But I'm trying to tell them they're in control of that. You know, they can actually determine when they're going to, you know, when their entry date will be, you know, and whoever buys their property, that will be, that'll be the condition of it. You know, and I try to explain that to people that, you know, I, I just think, well, one person I've managed to convince, <laughs> but I'm, I'm, I'm trying to talk to people now on that level, trying to convince them to, to right. see, we're just miss out, we're just going to miss out. <laughs> yeah, I think Ending that's really what it comes down to. You, yeah. if, you don't, if you don't jump, you're going to miss out. Okay, yeah. guys, thanks very much for coming on the show. I mean, to anybody out there, if you're a Fife homeowner or you're a Fife buy to let landlord, you'd like to chat about where you are and your Fife property stand in the current Fife property market, then please don't hesitate to give us a call. We're all here to help. You've seen us today. Um, so you know the faces, you know the people. And, uh, and guys, thanks very much. Thanks, Richard. Thanks, okay. May. Thanks, Andrea and Marie, Ruthie, Jimmy. Shaida and Charlotte, thanks guys for coming on the show. It's been absolutely fantastic. And thanks everybody else for watching. And that's uh, our weekly final show. Bye bye for now, guys. Bye. Cheers.